If I would ask you to tell me something about yourself, you would probably tell me something like your job, uh, your name, <laughs> your age, <laughs> your job, your hobby, uh, something you did in the past, or something you want to do in the future. This is what philosophers call the narrative self. It's your personal identity over time, and it's a story that you tell others about you, and it's probably what you think of when you hear the term the self. But it's not what I will be talking about today. The narrative self is very difficult to test. Everyone would make up a different story with a different focus. But there is one part of the self that is more similar between all of us. It's a more body self. It's what we call the minimal self. And it's the very basic experience of yourself in the here and the now. It's what you feel of yourself right in this moment, that you are the one sitting here and hopefully listening to me. Most of the time, we're not even aware of this concept. But today, I want you to actively experience your minimal self. It consists of two parts, and you can experience both of them with only one action. And to do so, I would ask you to please all clap your hands once. <laughs> Clapping your hands <laughs> produces sound. This is you who hears that sound through your ears. And this already is one part of the minimal self. It's what we call the sense of ownership. And it's the feeling of a body that is able to feel what happens around. Clapping your hand, uh, before the sounds, there was the clapping, the action. And you would probably all agree that it was you that clapped your hand, and thereby produced the sounds. And this is the second part of the minimal self. It's called the sense of agency, and it's the feeling of control over your actions and their consequences. Okay, now we already know both parts of the minimal self. On the one hand, there is the sense of ownership. We feel the body that senses what happens in the environment. And we can summarize this as, I heard the sound. On the other hand, there is the sense of agency, the feeling of being in control over our actions. And um, this we can summarize that as, it was me that produced the sound. Together, the sense of ownership and the sense of agency form the minimal self. But how do these senses come about? So let's focus on how the sense of ownership works first. The sense of ownership comes from the integration of different senses. Most of you will probably know the five basic senses from school. Vision, taste, touch, hearing, and smell. Apart from those basic senses, there are actually many more senses body, of which one is very important for the sense of ownership. It's called proprioception, and it's the sense of the location of your body. One example of your proprioception working perfectly fine is when you're eating something with a spoon. Most of the time, the spoon will make it from the plate to your mouth, without you needing a mirror to know where your hand is or where your mouth is. You just know where they are, and you know where you need to be. Okay, besides proprioception, vision and touch are most important for the sense of ownership, so let's forget about the other senses for now. To see how your sense of ownership is computed, let's take your hand as an example. If you see your hand in one location, if your hand touches something in the same location, and if you feel your hand being in the same location, then you can assume that this is your hand, because all of the information says the same. There is my hand. Consequently, you feel a sense of ownership for your hand. So if all the information that we have about different parts about our body says the same, then we feel a sense of ownership. To test the sense of ownership, a group of researchers came up with an experiment. The experiment is called D 
the rubber hand illusion. Participants are told to place their hand behind the high wall, so they definitely don't see it. And instead, in front of them, lies the rubber hand. Now the experimenter starts to stroke both hands at the same time. After some time in this video, the experimenter asks, how does that feel? And the man answers, it feels as if this rubber hand was my hand now. This experiment makes people replace their own hands by rubber hands. Of course, explicit questions are no foolproof measure. Maybe the participant just knew what the experimenter wanted to hear and said exactly that. So there is a different method to test this illusion. The experimenter suddenly pulls out a hammer and hits the fake hand with it. And as the fake hand gets hit with the hammer, you can see the woman screaming. She's so much into this illusion that she's afraid to feel the pain. That's a very surprising finding. Probably if I would have asked you before, no one would have guessed that you could ever think that a rubber hand is your own hand. So how is it possible that our brain is fooled like this? As I said, if all of the information we have comes from the same place, we feel a sense of emotion. So if you would see your own hand being stroked, you would see where your hand is, you would see the brush touching your hand, you would feel the brush touching your hand, and you would feel where your hand is right now. In the rubber hand illusion, touch and proprioception still come from your own hand, so you still feel the touch of the brush and you still feel the location of your hand. But the visual information says something else. You see the rubber hand in the location where your hand would usually be, and you see the brush touching the hand. That you now feel a sense of ownership tells us that not all of the information is similarly important when computing the sense of ownership. We trust our eyes much more than we trust our sense of touch or proprioception because our eyes are more reliable. It is so unlikely that our eyes are wrong that they override the information from touch and proprioception and we start to think that the rubber hand must be our own. Okay, now we know that we feel a sense of ownership because we combine all of the information from different senses. And by this, we trust our eyes more than the other language. So let's have a look at how the other part of the minimal self, the sense of agency, works. The sense of agency comes from the correct prediction of the consequences of your action. Let's go back to the clever your hand example. While I told you to perform this action, you already know and knew what was going to happen, meaning you could predict the result of this action. You knew that you were going to hear a clap. Now your brain compares the actual information, so the sound you heard, with the one you predicted, and if they match, you feel a sense of agency. So if you would have not heard a clap, but see a lightning, for example, the actual sensory consequences and your predicted ones would not match and you would not feel a sense of agency. Evidence for this mechanisms, the mechanism can be found in our brain. And to see what happens in our brain, we use a method called EEG. That's what sits on my head there. It's a cap with a lot of electrodes that measure the electrical activity of your brain over the time. If you hear a sound, your brain produces a wave to show that it processed the sound. If the sound now is the result of your own action, let's say you're clapping, the wave is smaller. And this is probably the case because your brain already knew what was going to happen and therefore needed less effort to process it. So whenever we cause something in our environment, our brain is perfectly prepared for what is going to happen. And if our brain is perfectly prepared, we feel a sense of agency. Saying it the other way around, whenever our brain is not perfectly prepared, as in this case, 
then it is very unlikely that we were the cause of this event and we do not feel a sense of agency. And the sense of agency is actually much more present in our everyday life than the sense of ownership. And one example from everyday life is that you cannot stick to yourself. I don't know if you ever tried it, if you never did, feel free to do so. You will feel the strange sensation, but it won't be comparable to someone else ticking you. And no matter how ticking you usually are, it will definitely not make you laugh. And the sense of agency is the reason for it. When you start to tickle yourself, your brain already knows what is going to happen. And as we have seen before, the reaction to it will be smaller. In contrast, when someone else wants to tickle you, you cannot perfectly predict the intensity or the location of this attack, and this surprise makes the tickle. Another example of your sense of agency actually not being uh, right all the time is uh, are those buttons. You probably know them, you have to press them for the light at crosswalks to turn green. Actually, most of the time during the day, they don't work. The light just works on the timer, so it will turn green after 90 seconds. But nevertheless, they make you have a feeling of control. <laughs> this is when you push the button, you will predict that the light will turn green. And after some time the light will turn green, your actual and your predicted consequences match. You feel a sense of agency. And the city is actually also happy because they have a happy pedestrian that feels like being able to control the traffic. <laughs> Okay, so we learned that there is a part of our self that we use to describe ourselves to other people, which is called the minimal self, and there is a more bodily self, which is the minimal self. We learned that the minimal self consists of the sense of ownership, which is the feeling of our body, and the sense of agency, which is the feeling of control. But what is this all good for, except for the sake of knowledge? One possible application of our knowledge are prosthesis. <laughs> prosthesis replace a body part of an amputee that's someone who lost a limb. And even if prosthesis get better and better, amputees still have a problem that they cannot really feel them as a part of their self. If we now study the minimal self in healthy people, we can find out the requirements something must fulfill to be integrated into our minimal self. So for example, it would be beneficial if all the sensory information that the amputee has from the prosthesis stays the same, so they can feel a sense of ownership. This in turn would probably improve the lives of amputees. Apart from bodily diseases, there are actually also mental diseases that could benefit from our knowledge about the minimal self. In some mental diseases, um, people do not, do not have a sense of agency for their thoughts. They don't think that they are their own, but that someone else implanted them into their heads. If we now study the sense of agency in healthy people, we can find out how it actually works, compare our knowledge to the behavior of the people with this mental illnesses, and see what's different. And this might eventually lead us to approaches for therapies for those people. A totally different and maybe more far-fetched application about our knowledge and our knowledge about the minimal self are robotics. Self-perception is something that is very beneficial to our independent human life. It makes us <coughs> being able to um, identify actions as our own or to, to distinguish us from other people. Um, if we could know how this exactly works in humans and what our brain exactly does to feel that way, it would make us able to program robots in a more safer and flexible way. We would not need to tell the robot 
to be able to identify every possible other and every possible situation, but we could just make the robot able to say, that is not me. And in the very end, knowing how the minimal self works can maybe help us to understand how the narrator self works and how we make a consistent story of ourselves over time.
and um, if I cannot come up with examples, and there is an easy answer, no. Um, so the research about the minimal self actually started because people thought the narrator self is something that is very interesting. How can we know that we are the same person than as we were a child? Although we look different, we think different, we feel different. But as I said, it's very, very difficult to test. And so the start is to get rid of everything that we cannot test right now and start with the minimal self because these are the very basic requirements that you would need to have to identify as yourself and right in this moment. And of course, this is the basis where all of this very high level stuff starts from. So it's going to be probably a very, very long journey to come up with the narrator right self in the end, but there, we need to start somewhere. And uh, at least that's the motivation to start with the minimum. Thank you very much.